This is Chapter 20, Pediatric Variations of Nursing Interventions. So just some general things. You're used to getting informed consents, but in pediatrics, realize that informed consent comes from the parent. Uh, so if we have some teenagers, and we sometimes do, if they're over 18, they get to sign their own consent. If we have a teen mom, then they are an emancipated minor, and they're the ones who sign the consent for their child. With kids, we, we get that legal informed consent, but we're also supposed to get assent if it's an older child or a teen, which just means that they know what's going to happen to them and they agree, but there's no nothing that they sign with that. Uh, think with that teenager, think about confidentiality. We may, a 16, 17 year old, we may be having the parent sign the consents, but we need to talk to that adolescent when the parents are not there so that we can get a good medical history um, about things like sexual activity and, and drug and alcohol use. And we probably are not going to get an honest answer in front of the parent. Parents do have the right to see their, their medical chart. Um, there are some forms they fill out, and, and then they do have that right to see that. Okay, so preparing a child for a procedure. We want to do this because it's going to make them less worried, less anxious, which is going to make them more cooperative and, and decrease their pain just by that sense of control. Um, psychological preparation think about their age the younger they are the shorter notice we're going to give them before we do a painful procedure a teenager we're probably going to give them a good amount of time so that they can google it and ask questions but it, a young child we don't want to do something painful without telling them it's happening so don't just poke them but you also they're going to be worried from the time you tell them, so don't tell them very far in advance. So the younger they are, the shorter notice you're going to give them. But always prepare them before you do something painful. Um, and that's part of that establishing trust, because they're not going to trust you if you're doing painful things without telling them first. Having parents present or not um, is a decision you're going to have to make based on the case. Some some parents just need to be there for their, they just are too anxious if they're not. Some absolutely don't want to be there, and you need to give them permission for that as well. And I would say toddlers and preschoolers, um, they may want the parent there. They say they want the parent there, but if the parent's there, they're mad at the parent. The parent is now one of the bad guys who did this painful thing to them. I've seen any number of kids who we do a painful procedure and then the parent goes to hug them and the kid folds their arms and, and pouts and refuses to hug the parent. They're mad because the parent was in the room and didn't protect them. So um, it really is a case-by-case -case basis of which is better. It depends on the, the family. Um, and then make sure we explain things to the child in, at a level they understand. We explain things to the parent at a level they understand so that they don't feel like we're talking down to them. But then we probably have to explain it again at a different level to the child. When you do get a chance to do a procedure, uh, with kids we try and do all painful procedures in the treatment room. We want the, their bed, their hospital room to be a safe place or as safe as possible. And if something bad is going to happen, it happens in another room, which means go in there and get it all ready first. You don't want to bring the child in there. They know something painful's coming and now you're tearing tape or getting out your dressing supplies. So get, have it all ready. Bring the child in. Expect success. Tell the child they're only going to be poked once or you know, this will come off, this dressing will come off very easily. Don't say, I think, I hope, maybe you're making that child more anxious by sounding insecure. So whether you feel insecure or not, act like it, you've done this a hundred times and it's going to be just fine. 
involve the child if possible. Kids love to push their own um, saline lock, uh, push the saline into that, or take off the parts of the dressing that they can. Um, so involve them as much as, as we can. There are some parts, sterile parts, obviously they can't do, but some parts they can. Provide distraction. If we can put on a movie or let them have a toy to play with, or if they're older, talk to them. Who's your favorite, your best friend? Who's your favorite movie star? What's, you know, your teacher's name? Ask them things just to distract them. Um, allow them to express their feelings. I always tell kids, it's okay to cry, but I need you to hold still for me. So I'm asking them to cooperate in what's really important, which is holding still, but I'm also giving them permission to cry if they need to. So tell them that's okay. You know, provide positive support. Don't just yell at them or tell them no or quit doing that. Be encouraging, be positive. Um, use play as much as you can. Again, kids like to push their own saline locks. Uh, if we can let them do the same procedure on a doll before we do it on them, things like that are really good. And make sure everyone's prepared, the family as well as the child. And here's a picture of a hospitalized child and a couple of siblings, I think, doing procedures on a doll. They've all got gloves on and they've got a stethoscope so they're um, playing through and decreasing their anxiety by getting a chance to to act out what's going to happen. When we do surgery on a child um, we want to prepare the child obviously there's some physical preparation that usually happens some sedation maybe but also psychologically prepare them again the parents, we would usually want them present as long as possible. And if we can go and talk to them and talk with the child a little bit so that they get comfortable with us, and then we take them into the, the operating suite, we want to do that the last minute when we're taking them away from the parent. Uh, they, some doctors and some procedures, we're going to give them some sedation medication first. It relieves anxiety, and the medicines we use have an amnesic effect, and that's really nice. Kids don't remember a lot of the scary parts of, of their surgery. Um, it, that depends on the doctor as well as the procedure as well as the family, but it is a nice thing sometimes. Postoperatively, uh, we've got a lot of negative effects from our anesthesia. Many people wake up nauseous uh, or just wake up, you know, anxious or um, they've had surgery so they're in pain. So we want to minimize all those effects. Make sure you have the equipment you're going to need there because in PACU, in recovery, if a kid goes bad, they go bad fast. So they have everything right there. Many of you will get to go to PACU for your one of your clinical sites. And um, if you often nothing goes wrong, and so you don't get to see a lot. But when something goes wrong, it's very dramatic and happens very fast. So everything's got to be right there and ready to go. Uh, pain management. They've had surgery. We should expect them to be in pain. We're going to do our best to control the pain. But we also need to get them breathing deeply. In surgery, you are not breathing deeply. And when you come out, we need you to take deep breaths and re-expand your lungs. We're going to talk about this when we do respiratory. But with kids, blowing bubbles. you got to take a big breath to blow those bubbles. Or blowing a pinwheel. Again, you take a big breath to blow the pinwheel. And um, they're usually much more cooperative with that than just telling them to take big breaths. And then obviously after surgery, we're observing for complications. General hygiene and care on kids. Um, if you get the chance to bathe a baby, you should do it. Partly, bathing, bathing babies is just fun, but it's a great time to do a good assessment. It's when you really get to do you know, that full skin assessment, looking at everything. Um, oral hygiene. Make sure we're having our 
our patients brush their teeth. Many kids don't brush their teeth without reminders at home. They're not going to do it at the hospital. Hair care. If we have a child, especially a girl with long hair, who's in bed for days, that hair is going to get all matted and be impossible to brush. So maybe we need to, to brush it and braid it um, coming out the you know two braids on the sides so that it doesn't get matted. Feeding. A toddler needs finger foods, needs you to cut up their food into little pieces, but they want to feed themselves, but they need you to get it ready. So think about your child and what they need. Fever. Fever is something that we tend to overtreat. Parents really overtreat fever. Most of the time, fever is not a bad thing. It's got to go up very high and stay there for a length of time to really be a concern. Um, kids spike higher fevers and they do a whole lot better than adults. So most of the time we're giving Tylenol to relieve the discomfort more than to bring the fever down. But again, parents, they, they're uncomfortable when their child is running a fever and they want to bring that fever down. Hyperthermia is a different thing. This is where their temperature is up. Uh, Tylenol usually doesn't help and this is where you do have to do um, other measures to decrease the temperature where parents tend to, to jump to this a little too quickly. Um, and then family education and home care. If we're sending a kid home or they've come into the ED and we send them home, we need to make sure that they've gotten good teaching and that they understand. You have a parent who's very anxious and you're trying to teach them what to do at home. They're not going to retain very much of what you tell them. So we need to be really good with education. Safety. Just like with your adults, safety is a big and important issue. Make sure a child has a, a identification band on. On kids, they're often on the ankle or the wrist. It's also acceptable for it to be on anything that stays attached to that child. And usually what you'll see is the EKG leads will have it on there. It is not acceptable for it to be on the bed or the bedside table or the counter, something like that. So if a child does not have their ID band on, you need somebody who knows that child to identify them and get a new one on. If we have a toddler, running around the room. We need to think about the sorts of things parents are child-proofing their house at home. The electrical. Uh, we need to make sure we don't have small objects out. If you're with me and we give oral medications, I'm going to make you count the syringes and the caps to make sure that we throw away the same number of caps as syringes. Furniture. Kids bang their heads onto furniture all the time. They trip and have bruises across their forehead. So let's not let that happen at the hospital. So think about safety with their toys. Are the toys appropriate for their age? We want to make sure there's not small pieces that will be a choking hazard. Think about fall prevention um, and then sleep safety. We want babies uh, to sleep on their backs, back to sleep. I like this picture. If you need to reach and get something while you're caring for a patient at the hospital, you need to keep one hand on that child and reach with the other hand. If you can't reach it while keeping a hand on the child, you got to pull up the rail, go get what you need, and then come back.